Uh, Dr. Miller, Dr. Garber, my name is Gregory McDade, and I am uh, counsel for Dr. Alex Morton and for the Aquaculture Coalition. Um, just in starting, uh, uh, Dr. Miller, my uh, client uh, has instructed me to say that we want to thank you for your courage and for the fascinating work that you've done uh, on these studies. It's obviously very important. Um, it's a bit of a detective story, as I, as I hear it, um, unwinding some of this. And uh, clearly, we're in the middle of a scientific process. Um, so as I understand it, you weren't looking for a disease or a virus when you started this work. You were looking for the explanation for early entry. Early, early entry and poor um, survivorship in the river, yes. Um, and. What you've found is um, what is likely, but abs not proven to scientific certainty yet, some sort of new virus. That is, that is correct. We, we have identified um, a, a novel virus, meaning it's, it hasn't been described before, um, the sequence of a novel virus in salmon that contained the signature that we identified in the science paper. And your current leading, uh, if I can put it, suspect in this matter is, is the parvovirus. At, at the moment, that is our candidate virus. And um, you, um, you haven't confirmed it's parvovirus. Um, that's what you're working on. If the question is we haven't confirmed it's parvovirus that causes the MRS, Yes. That is correct. That is what that is what we hope the disease challenge work will do. And uh, for a couple of years, or certainly in a lot of your early material, your leading suspect was uh, salmon leukemia virus. Yes, it was. And as I understand it, um, you haven't ruled out salmon leukemia virus at this point. No, I have not. Um, it, it it has to be clear that that the salmon leukemia virus itself has never been isolated. There's no sequence information for it. So there is a postulated virus associated with plasmacytoid leukemia. Um, and, um, and, and the work, unfortunately, of the investigators of plasmacytoid leukemia never, never identified a specific viral agent associated with that disease. Um, it is still possible that um, that this parvovirus could somehow relate to that. Right. The um, because SLV was never actually. Um, uh, what was your term? It's never been isolated in sequence. So there, there, there is no cell culture of it. There is no um, sequence of a virus. There's, there's no confirmation that a virus actually existed. Direct. And confirmation. And similarly, you haven't culture, you haven't successfully cultured uh, parvovirus. We have had equally difficult um, and and lack of success in terms of culturing um, the parvovirus. Yes. So we're really in the same place with those two viruses at this point. At, at this point, we we certainly don't have evidence that it's not that, um, but we don't have any evidence that it is directly. And and the symptoms are. What led you at f to first suspect salmon leukemia virus is that the the symptoms you were finding are were quite a bit similar. Yes, there there you know I, I, some some of the symptoms that 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 I talk about are things that I hear from the field. Um, people who people who are on the ground sampling sockeye salmon. David Patterson is is my collaborator that's on the ground and his team, and 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 oftentimes they. They have noted, you know, you know, associated with these mortalities in the river, you know, the fish look really healthy. They look really good externally. Sometimes they have pale gills. Sometimes they seem to have bleeding disorders. But not looking through histology, but just simply looking at the condition of the fish from an external um, standpoint, they look really good and healthy. And those are those are sometimes the kinds of things that people would say when when fish fish were um, at least that I had heard. Um, when fish were dying of, of marine anemia, that, that there were fish that actually looked good externally, not necessarily through histology, um, that had pale gills, and they were simply dying. 
Um, and so I thought that that was, that was an interesting parallel. And the other interesting parallel was that, you know, the pale gills is an indicator of anemia. And uh, marine anemia or plasmacytoid leukemia, you know, is, is an anemia-related disease. We've seen anemia-like symptoms in sockeye salmon as well. And, and really, the primary similarity is Im immunosuppression, if I pronounce that correctly. They're, they're both diseases of Im immune immunosuppression. A, a large number of viruses, and Garth, or, um, and Kyle can speak to this probably better than I can, but I mean, there, oh, many viruses can induce immunosuppression, but, but um, you know, yes, that, that, that is potentially another common feature. And I understand that um, the uh, suspect salmon leukemia virus was a retrovirus, which, and, and the parvovirus is a DNA-based virus. What, what, as far as I understand it, and you had the two experts sitting here uh, the last two days, and you will have another expert, Sonia Saxida from CAUSE, here in, in another week, week and a half, who will be testifying. She did a master's degree on plasma cytoid leukemia as well. And um, as, um, as I understand it, the evidence that, that it was a retrovirus and not some other kind of virus was twofold. One, that they had positive RT assays, um, and two, that they thought that they observed tumors behind the eyes of, of the fish that, that um, um, carried plasma cytoid leukemia. Now, I'm sure you were <laughs> listening when, when Mike Kent was testifying in the last couple of days, and he seems to have backtracked on whether or not those uh, lesions behind the eyes were in fact tumorous or whether they could have been inflammatory cells. Um, and I was quite, uh, that was the first time I'd ever heard that mentioned. Um, so I, I guess I'm not, he's not now, he doesn't appear to be strongly convinced that it is a, a retrovirus anymore. And so I'm a little bit less convinced that it has to be a retrovirus associated with that and not something, some other kind of um, virus. So is it fair to say at this point you haven't ruled out a retrovirus or a DNA virus? It could be either. We, in, in sequencing about 250 different, uh, thousand different reads of RNA, we did not uncover any retroviral sequences that were not already endogenous in the salmon genome. Um, and so, but that's not, you know, that's the, mo the most intensive sequencing one can do. Um, when heart and skeletal muscle inflammatory um, disease, when, when they, they identified a Rio virus um, in association with that, um, out of, out of a, a couple hundred thousand reads, they only got one 240 base sequence one time out of that that turned out to be important and they went back and they did another, they did another 500,000 reads to actually get more of the virus. So it's, it's not impossible that there could be other um, viruses, you know, contained in, in, in fish that, that carry that signature. But um, right now my feeling is we need to follow through the parvovirus, see whether that could be causative. If it's not, we'll go back and, and, and see what else there might be. And HSMI, or heart and skeletal muscle, uh, is, uh, is a, currently a disease causing significant problems in Norway's fish farms. Yes, it is, and it's a disease that has been under study for over a decade and caused a lot of problems for over a decade. And it is, on, it is only, and they've been trying to isolate and trying to identify a pathogen associated with it, and, and they finally came up with a sequence. There's some still question as to whether this particular virus is, is absolutely causative as well. This stuff takes time. But it's only because they used a molecular, uh, really a genomics approach that they were able to obtain a sequence finally after 10 years of studying this. So is it possible it could take us a number of years to actually nail this virus down? I'm sure hoping not. And, and you know, we've cut a lot of corners and I think we've come really far and really fast, but there are some experimental studies that have to be done um, before we can move too far forward. Dr. Garver, is it possible it could take a year or longer to, uh, to identify this virus, if ever? Uh, have you had a science class? Because <laughs> <laughs> that is science. That is pretty much the definition of science. It will take a considerable amount of time, yes. Well, it's been a considerable amount of time since I've had a science class, too. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I should, I should just mention, we, we do have a candidate virus. So if you're saying identifying a virus, we have identified a, a candidate virus well, at this time. Um, so uh, it's possible that, uh, I, as I understood your earlier answers, it's also possible that the, 
disease that was being identified or the virus that was being researched by Dr. Kent back in the 90s might in fact have been parvovirus. That is definitely possible. Um, the, the difficulty with trying to relate that disease or that syndrome with, with the parvovirus is that there don't appear to be tissue samples of fish that carry marine anemia available to compare to the, the samples that we have. Um, and because there is no one studying that particular syndrome or disease, uh, usually they're called a syndrome unless you have an etiological agent and then they can be caused, called a, a disease. I think we learned that the last couple of days. Um, but, um, you know, it, it makes it difficult. And, and, and I guess if, I, if, if, if we can't find someone who's actually studying that and, and diagnosing marine anemia, um, it will be very difficult to determine whether or not they are the same thing. Perhaps with histology, if we can, if we can um, um, do the challenge work and, and find disease and mortality, perhaps one can look at the histological signatures um, from the parvovirus and determine if they're anything like what's been observed in marine anemia. Um, that, at the moment, is the only sort of indirect way we've got. Okay, so whether this is parvovirus or SLV, um, uh, well, if, uh, let, me, uh, let me ask it this way. If, if this is parvovirus, it's never been seen in fish in BC prior to this time. It, we did not know of it, its existence prior to this. And, and in fact, I think you're, you're probably on the cutting edge here. It's, it's really the first time it's being identified in fish. A parvovirus, yes, it has never been identified in fish. So when you get to the point, if you do, of sequencing this, uh, it'll be a new virus. When we have the, the full sequence, and yes. So um, you'll get to give it a name, I suppose. If it's like astronomy, it gets to be called Miller virus. <laughs> <laughs> it will get a name when we have a full sequence. All right, because parvovirus is just a generic type of virus, right? It'll be called something. Uh, it'll have something to do with salmon, probably. Right. All right, so whatever its name, whether we call it Miller virus or something else, um, it is quite, what we do know from your work in science and, and uh, the last four years of research, is what we do know is that it's, it is associated with the whole early entry phenomenon and the en route mortality. The, there is an association in the 2006 study of the MRS signature with more rapid entry into the river and actually faster migration to the spawning grounds. Um, that study needs to be repeated in other years to ensure that that signature is related to rapid entry into the river in other years, and that's something that we will have from our 2010 data. Um, we have not shown that the, that the parvovirus itself um, is associated with that, but we certainly have the samples to be able to do that. Uh, Mr. Lynn, if I might just put uh, two or three documents up on the screen. Um, uh, uh, they're all related, I think. Exi let's start with Exhibit 1516, which we looked at earlier today. Now, this document has been identified, and I understand the comments in it were Dr. Garber's. So this is a draft of a document that was later finalized. Um, can we have uh, Commission Document 21 up on the screen? Um, Just on 1516, I'm not sure if it's ever been finalized or if there's evidence of that. Well, that's what I'm about to ask about, I think. Well, you just started by saying it was later finalized. Well, I think this is the final version, is it not? Um, uh, Dr. Miller, this is a version dated October 7th, 2009. It seems to be a very close correlation with the document we just looked at. Um. I think this. I think this is the latest version that I've seen, but I stand to be corrected. This this was not the final version of a briefing note, if that's what you're asking. All right. This, in any event, this document was prepared by you on October seventh, two thousand and nine. It was. It was prepared in conjunction with the talk that I gave, um, the intra departmental um, talk that I gave, associated with the same title. And Mr. Lang, can we put up DFO five nine eight nine eight? That's uh, one of the later documents that are 
uh, produced this week. by the Conservation Coalition. I'll get it for you. Uh, 598981. Yes. Uh, yes, that's, that's the one I'm looking for. Um, that's also prepared by you, Dr. Miller? Yes, that looks to be a slightly earlier version. So can we have those uh, two versions uh, marked as exhibits? Uh, tab 21 will be marked as uh, 1,523. DFO 598981 will be marked as 524, or 1,524. Let's just stick with that uh, particular uh, document for a few minutes. Um, the, um, so that in the first, uh, in the bullet in the middle of the page, the first uh, open bullet, uh, you note that the uh, salmon starting from 300 kilometers seaward uh, had a 16 times lower probability of arriving to spawning grounds um, in terms of the healthy signature. Um, and in the second bullet that there's um, some, uh, it may be associated with losses of up to 90% uh, if you count river entry timing uh, losses. Um, have you made a calculation of how many fish that might actually involve in the, uh, we're talking about many, many millions of fish, aren't we? Um, yes, this, this was based on, on the, the, the prevalence of, of fish um, containing the signature. And um, I'm trying to, it's the second bullet you're talking about, right? Yes, yes, thank you. Oh, yeah, well, and, it, and it's also got the, the additional physiological information. So um, um, Scott Hinch and his group have, have also found physiological indicators um, associated with um, um, advanced entry timing and, um, and losses in the river. So um, it, it was including sort of his estimates as well. Okay, can we go to document 15, exhibit 1512? Um, and if we could scroll down to the final bullet there. The, uh, you looked at, we looked at this document this morning as well. Um, I see there that you've done a calculation saying if the, the uh, decreases were really from the causes of mortality, uh, in 2008 there may have been as many as 27 million uh, salmon. In, in, in order to see the, the decrease in prevalence that we observed, um, if that decrease in prevalence were due to be due to mortality, and that was something that still needs to be demonstrated, um, that that were how many fish basically that were missing, that we didn't see in our second, in the second sample period. And can we go to exhibit 1513 and go to page six? We also looked at this this morning. I just want to try and understand this. In a, this is a comparison between 2007 and 2008. Um, so in, in 2007, um, you found a much heavier prevalence of the MRS uh, in the smolts than you did in the uh, 2008 smolts. That's correct. It was a small sample size because that's all that was available to us. But but most of the fish that we sampled in ocean in the ocean at the end of June um, contained this, this signature in 2007, whereas it was less than 40% in, in 2008. We have actually since amplified parvovirus out of these same fish, and we see the same phenomena. The same phenomena was We prevalent. see a much higher prevalence in 2007 than we do in 2008. And um, 
if in fact the mortality is related, uh, as we just discussed, that would seem to indicate to me that the impacts in the 2007 smolts or the 2009 fish uh, would be much heavier than that of the 2008 smolts, 2010 fish. Yes, potentially. So we could be talking about many, many millions of fish here. I did a calculation somewhere in one of these talks, but, but yes, um, we're talking on the order of, of, I can't remember what it was, um, three or four times more fish in, in, in the least between those different years. We're, we're talking millions of fish, yes. And, and so is, is it fair to suggest that this particular MRS, if it turns out to be the virus and if it turns out to have the mortality that you've speculated about, really could be a very, very significant explanation for the 2009 decline? If we can demonstrate that this virus causes disease and has an and mortality of fish in the early marine environment, under certain circumstances, it doesn't necessarily have to be every year. There could be a, there, I certainly expect that the, the role of the environment will be a strong one. But if we demonstrate that when fish are entering the ocean and they become stressed in the ocean and they carry a high load of this virus that we see significantly enhanced mortality, they're certainly given the prevalence rates of fish that we see in certain years with this parvovirus, there is certainly the potential that this virus could have a major impact on salmon declines. And if, if in fact that's the case, using the terminology that we heard uh, yesterday, this in fact may be the smoking gun for the 2009 declines. It could be the smoking gun. And we have heard you, I think, say, although this matter is not proven yet to be a virus that causes disease, you're prepared to say that's your strong speculation that in fact that will be proven. <laughs> um, I have, I have some level of confidence that, that we will find disease with this virus, but we do have to do the work. Now, if I could go back to um, 1524. And if we could go to page three of that document. Now, if I just look at the last bullet on the page, which is, I think, the end of the document. Oh, no, sorry, the end of that section. Um, there are several little elements of the history and timing of descriptions of PLSLV that potentially implicate this virus in the, the large-scale declines of coho and Chinook salmon in BC and may be suggestive of a role in hatcheries and aquaculture in this decline. You wrote that at the time, didn't you? I, I think I should be clear. I was reviewing the literature that mo mostly came from Mike Kent and, and, and Bill Eaton and others who'd done this, who studied this disease. I wouldn't, I, I am not an expert on plasmacytoid leukemia. Yeah. Um, and, but in, in my purviewing, and I, and I think you've seen the document that I made when I was originally interested in this disease, looking at the timing of various events and looking at, at, um, at the timing of when this was discovered and, and, and et cetera. Um, it was my view at the time that it, it was a very interesting disease and it was largely overlooked. And um, I was interested in whether or not, A, it could be related to what we're observing in sockeye. And if it was related to what we were observing in sockeye, whether or not it could be a factor in declines of multiple species. And so can I turn over the page? Uh, and you prepared a chart on the next page. Yeah, that's the one I'm talking about. Yes. And um, when you went, at, uh, when you were speaking at this time and to the PSC, I've seen in a number of documents that you refer to as the timing is issues. This is one of the, the arguments at the time you considered in favor of the SLV hypothesis is, is the correlations in timing between these various matters happening at the same time, isn't it? Yeah, the one, the one thing that, uh, that, given what we know now, that would need to be removed from this, however, is that 
we didn't have ocular tumors. Um, and so all references to that, since we saw hemorrhaging in the oc oc ocular lobe as opposed to tumors, that that data would not relate um, or would not be validated in the, at, at this point or would not be really right. accurate. That seems quite reasonable. Um, but the, um, the key issue about the uh, timing here, as I understand it, is that the connection that was present in your mind then and is still in your mind today with early entry, that's a behavior that goes back to the early 90s. Yes. And that was... In 1996, really, the early entry behavior in sockeye salmon started in 1996. Right. And so that would have been the generation of uh, the brood stock from 1992. That's correct. And um, the declines in productivity that we've seen in the sockeye salmon that, the, that is behind this commission's mandate really dates back to about 1992 as well, doesn't it? In the focus on sockeye salmon and early entry and poor... Sorry, the decline? Uh, the decline. The um, decline in productivity. It, I think it goes about, about that far. And now, one thing I, I would also like to correct here is that, and Mike Kent is the one that corrected this, is that they actually did not observe positive sockeye salmon in 1991 in their, in their surveys. That, that was unclear to me. I thought that they had. Because they never looked for it, isn't that right? They did a very cursory look. But there's no question that uh, marine anemia or plasmacytoid leukemia, or whatever that disease was, if it was parvovirus at the time, it was killing huge amounts of Chinook fish in fish farms from 1988 to 1991. That was an important fact to you at the time, wasn't it? That was, that was of some import to me, but I'm not the one who observed that, so I'm probably not the one who should report on it. But um, yes, that it had been killing fish, um, Chinook salmon, um, during those periods of time, yes, it, it was something that I thought was important. And now, today I heard you say that um, you would tend to suggest that aquaculture might not be directly implicated because of the fact that the, uh, the smolts coming out of the river have this MRS. And I can see the logic behind that. Um, but that doesn't answer the question of where this disease came from in the first place, does it? It absolutely doesn't, no. And it's quite possible that the... Um, because you find the adults who have come past the fish farms, um, or let's just, sorry, let's just say the adults coming back to the river are, uh, show this MRS uh, in a gr to a great deal. And they're the parents of the smolts, right? That's correct. Um, they, they show the signature regardless of which route they take around Vancouver Island. But yes, they show the signature coming back. So that suggests two possibilities to me. One is the possibility you refer to in this document, which is the disease is vertically transmitted. That is, it's transmitted from the um, adult fish through the eggs to the, uh, to the young fish. That's a possibility, isn't it? It, it? it certainly is not unusual for parvoviruses to be um, transmitted vertically. However, there was a there was an interesting review I think that the BC Salmon Farmers Association put in by Dr. Lewis, um, who's a virologist, who suggested that he felt that the probability for vertical transmission was low because in other species where vertical transmission with parvoviruses was a common route of transmission, um, you saw loss of the fetus, and, and he, he concluded that you would have um, losses of, of, of eggs. Kyle could really respond to this better than I could. We, we, have, we have discussed this. I would say we really don't have any data on this, so I, it would be pure, pure speculation. It is pure speculation. It could be vertically transmitted. It may not be. But that would be one mechanism which would explain why the adults had it and the, the babies had it. Yes, and that, that's something we are looking at earlier life history stages to find out how early we can identify this parvovirus out of, out, out of fry. And right now, the earliest you've identified is, is in smolts, isn't that right? Um, in terms of the signature, the earliest we've identified it is in November before a fish is going to smolt in, in their natal rearing areas. So before they leave their natal lakes. Um, 
So that w would tend to suggest it's, it's vertically transmitted, wouldn't it? Doesn't necessarily. It can still be horizontally transmitted in, in the natal lakes. From you adults? Want to jump in, Kyle? <laughs> yes, go ahead, Dr. Gray. Uh, I'll just step back here a little bit. As a scientist, I, I'm really concerned with all the speculation that's going on here. We have a we have a parvovirus sequence. We don't have it linked to a disease. We don't have it linked to mortality. We don't know how it's transmitted. We don't know if it causes disease. We don't have any pathology associated with it. So if we're sitting around discussing scientifically hypothesis, this is fine. But if we're actually trying to get to some answers, spec it's pure speculation. Now, uh, on addition to the, the other questions that are being asked, yes, there could be multiple reservoirs. Just because we're finding it in Salmonids doesn't mean it's not in other fin fish that reside in a lake. So yes, it could potentially be in other species in a lake and could therefore be transmitted horizontally. But again, this is pure speculation since we don't even know if it's transmitted, nor do we know if it's infectious. All right, well, I apologize, Dr. Garver, if we are not yet meeting the scientific standards that you have for proof, but it's equally pure speculation that it's not in coming from aquaculture then, isn't it? We don't know. That's right. We don't know where it is and no. what species it's in. Right now, we don't even know if it's a true virus other than the fact that we have a sequence. Now, Dr. Miller, it must have caused great consternation in the DFO when you put that paragraph in connecting it to aquaculture in 2009, didn't it? You got, you got some blowback on that, didn't you? Um, I, what paragraph are you talking? I'm not sure. Can we go back to Exhibit 1524 then? Or just back that page, just the previous page. That last paragraph there. The first sentence. I, I would say there was concern, but I, I don't. I don't think there was a a, a large pushback. Well, um, if we can go to fifteen twenty three, which is, can we go to the same place in that document, the, just above number four, which would be page three? Now, what I see here is that particular. When I compare these two documents, if can uh, Ms. Glenn, can we put this up, both documents up on the screen in the same place? So what, uh, that should be enough. What we have there is in document one on September 27th, we have the, the same five bullets and then a paragraph. And in document two, we have the same five bullets and no paragraph. It seems to have miraculously disappeared. Um, was that because of pressure you received inside the department? I, 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 th I think there was some concern over the speculative nature of that comment. Um, in the first one. I honestly don't remember the dialogue that occurred associated with that, but um, I, I think that, that many felt that to be highly speculative and um, not really su well supported. So it's, this would be an appropriate time to break, Mr. Commissioner. Mr. Commissioner, with respect to our timing, I've been canvassing and, uh, and continually being at the regular time of 10 a.m. tomorrow, please. Thank you. Hearing is now adjourned for the day. And we're